Do you know that there is only one God in three eternal persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Do you know that Jesus said he is the only way to heaven, and his death and resurrection bring forgiveness of sins to all who believe? Welcome to the Pastor Study, a ministry of pastorstudy.org. Join us now as we study God's Word, the Bible, together. Welcome to the Pastor's Study. If you watch this program regularly, you might remember that I did a program where I asked you this question. Do you know what happened on April 15th, 1912? You remember? The Titanic sunk. 2,200 people were on board. The newspaper had a big headline, Titanic sinks. Bold letters, the left column, the lost. 1,500 names. Bold letters, the right column, the saved. 700 names. Everybody in that Titanic was either lost or saved. Everybody watching this program right now, you're either lost and going to hell, or you're saved and you're going to heaven. The Bible teaches there's an eternal heaven, there's an eternal hell. When you die, you go to one of those two places for all eternity. I think the main problem with the American church today, many churches no longer preach salvation. I mean, I'm a TV preacher. Watch a lot of the TV preachers. It's all about health and wealth. And if you believe properly, you're going to get money and you're going to be healed of your cancer. Or the worst guys are the ones that say, you send me money and you're going to get money. And, and one of the most popular preachers in America, it's all about positive thinking. He talks about Jesus some, but it's mostly, you, you, you have faith and you're going to get that better job. And, eh. and then you've got the liberal churches. And in the liberal churches, they don't preach salvation because you don't need salvation. God is love. Everybody goes to heaven. There's no hell. Well, listen, I've shared this before, but I'm going to say it again. I used to be an ELCA Lutheran, that's the very liberal branch of Lutheranism, till I led my church to a more biblical branch of Lutheranism. But a Chicago newspaper asked Elizabeth Eaton, the head bishop of the ELCA, Bishop Eaton, is there a hell? There may be, but I think it's empty. What Bible is she reading? Jesus talked about people in hell weeping and gnashing their teeth. So we need to get back in the Christian church today to preaching salvation. And that's what I'm going to do on this program. Here are the three main points I want you to get today. Number one, God saved you by himself. Number two, God saved you for himself. And number three, God saved you from himself. Let's get into these points and let's pray. Father, we pray for anyone watching this program who is lost and when they die, they're going to eternal hell. Oh Lord, somehow bring them into the saved category that they'll put their faith in Christ and trust in him to forgive their sins. Lord, speak to us now about salvation. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. First point today. God saved you by himself. Contrary to proper popular belief, you don't save yourself by being good enough. You don't try real hard and then you save yourself by your good deeds or whatever. No, no, no. God saved you by himself. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2 says, By grace you've been saved through faith. It's a gift of God, not of your good works, lest any man should boast. If you happen to go to a church that teaches that you save yourself by A, B, C, D, or uh, uh, no, no, no. It's only the, you, you want to find a church that preaches amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Make sure you go to a church that teaches we're saved by grace alone, by what Christ did on the cross alone. I, I, I remember an old Lutheran professor at my seminary who said, I am grateful I am saved 100% by Jesus Christ and not this much by me. Because he said, 
I have trouble doing this much. <laughs> so number one point, God saved you by himself. He did it, not you. Second point I want you to get, God saved you for himself. 2 Corinthians 5 says, Christ died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. The reason God saved you was for himself. He wants you for himself. He wants you to serve him in some way. Perhaps you have heard of Pastor John Piper, kind of a famous preacher nationally now. He's in Minneapolis, but written a lot of books. I know him a little bit. He taught me Greek uh, in college. Years ago, I go to hear Pastor Piper preach. He and I are talking in the narthex of his church. And while we're talking, somebody comes up, say, Pastor Piper, do you see that older couple over there? Yeah. Well, you remember when you preached a sermon that when you retire, you shouldn't buy a Winnebago and vacation the rest of your life away. You should find some ministry to serve the Lord in your golden years. Yes, I remember. And he said, well, they had just bought a Winnebago. And they heard that sermon. They sold the Winnebago. And now they have a Christian literature ministry giving away Christian pamphlets at bus stops, or truck stops. Or so <laughs> I heard that. That's what, it, that's what it means. God saved you for himself, for you to do something to serve the Lord. God saved you by himself, by grace alone. God saved you for himself to serve him. Third thing, God saved you from himself. Now, I know, I know that sounds weird, but listen to this verse from Romans 5. Since we now have been justified by Christ's blood, that means we've been declared not guilty of our sins by Christ's atoning death, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him, through Christ? The Bible teaches that God saved us from his own wrath. You know, maybe this story will help. It's kind of a confusing concept, but it's crucial. Once upon a time lived good King Schimmel by the shores of the Black Sea. He was a good king, but his kingdom was corrupt. Crime in the streets, bribery in the courts. So the king wants to improve his kingdom. He issues an edict. Starting January 1st, anyone caught in the act of bribing a judge will publicly be taken to the whipping post and given a hundred lashes of the whip on the bare back. It's posted all over the kingdom. January 1st comes. Things are fine for two weeks. There's no crime in the streets. There's justice in the courts. But after two weeks, a person is found bribing a judge. It was Schimmel's own mother. And for three days, he agonizes in the castle what to do. And the people are wondering, will he show favoritism or will he let justice be done? Finally, because he knew he had to uphold the law to keep his kingdom pure, he said, take her to the post. But the whole kingdom gathered and with the king himself in the front row, they led his mother up to the post. The executioner tied her hands ripped the clothing off of her back, took the whip, struck her once, struck her twice, and the king jumped up and shouted, stop. He ran up, untied his mother's hands, ripped the shirt off his own back, put his hands to the wood and said, I will pay the rest. And with the whole kingdom watching, he bore 98 lashes of the whip and his mother went home free. That's what Jesus did. You and I deserve God's wrath. And God is a holy king. He has to punish sin if he's to remain a righteous holy king. But he couldn't bring himself to do it to us. 
So what God did, God became a human being. His name was Jesus. He lived the perfect life we couldn't live. So when he went to the cross, he didn't pay 98 lashes. He paid all 100 lashes of the whip. He took our punishment for us so we could be forgiven and go to heaven someday. That's what it means to say that God saved us from his own wrath. In 1950, Marine Lieutenant Robert Rehm was leading his men in battle in Korea. Suddenly, a live grenade landed in the midst of his men. Quickly, Lieutenant Rehm threw himself on the grenade, killed him, but the rest of his men were safe. That's what Jesus did on the cross. The grenade is the wrath of God, the holy, righteous justice of God against our sin. Jesus absorbs the punishment for our sin so we could be forgiven and go to heaven. God saved you from yourself, excuse me, from himself, for himself, by himself. I'm going to add, though, one last point. God saved you from yourself. Paul writes this in Romans 7, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the body of this death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let me ask you, do you understand that you're a wretch and that you deserve hell? Until you understand that, Jesus will make no sense to you. Many years ago, there was an Indian chief who came to faith in Christ. Some of the other neighboring chiefs heard about this. They wanted to meet with him. And they gathered together and they said to him, we hear now that you're saved. What does this mean, this saved? And the old chief took a worm and put it on the ground. He took some old dry wood chips and put them on a circle. And then he lit the wood chips and the chiefs watched as the word tried worm tried to get out that way and then tried to get out this way kept being repelled back in the middle until finally the chief took his hand pulled the worm out of the ring put it to the side and he said i was that worm i am a sinner and i couldn't save myself until our great chief jesus christ came from heaven died on the cross, rose from the dead, to pull us out of the flames. Believe in him. That is what it means to be saved. Until you understand that you're a wretch, that you're a sinner, Jesus won't make any sense to you. Let's review. God saved you by himself. He did it, not you. It's called grace. God saved you for himself so he would use you to bring other people to Christ. God saved you from himself, from his own wrath. And God saved you, hallelujah, from yourself. <laughs> I want to close with this. Let's go back to the Titanic. Four years after the Titanic sunk, a young Scotsman stood up in a church meeting in Hamilton, Canada, and he said this, <clears throat> I am a survivor of the Titanic. When I was drifting alone on a spar that awful night, the tide brought a Mr. John Harper of Glasgow on a piece of wreck near me. Man, he said, are you saved? No, I said, I am not. He replied, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. The waves bore him away, but strange to say, brought him back a little later. And he said, are you saved now? No, I said, I cannot honestly say that I am. He said again, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And shortly after he went down, there, alone in the night, with two miles of water under me, I believed. I am John Harper's last convert. Everybody on the Titanic was either lost or saved. Everybody watching this TV program, you're either lost or saved. I urge you, come to Christ, 
Believe that God saved you by himself. You couldn't do it. That's why you need Christ. Number two, believe God saved you for himself. He has something he wants you to do for him. Number three, uh, believe that God saved you from himself, from his wrath, and you can be forgiven of all your sins and have God smile on you because of Christ. And lastly, hallelujah, God saved us from ourselves because we're all sinners, we're all wretches. We need to be saved from ourselves. Amen. Welcome to the portion of the pastor's study where we ask Pastor Brock questions regarding the Bible. Pastor Brock, our first question today comes from a viewer. I know someone who was, ra was raised as a Christian, or I know someone who was raised as a Christian, but she doesn't like the idea of God sending people to hell forever. She thinks that it is sadistic and that people should be punished for a while and then wiped out. All I thought to tell her was that sin is worse than we think it is and its consequences last longer than we think. Is there a better response? Actually, that's a pretty good response. But, you know, my situation, Mona, I was raised in a good Christian church that believed in hell. I went away to college and my first year I got kind of liberal. And I went to a Bible study and said, well, you know, if you were Buddhist, if you were Chinese, you'd be a Buddhist too. Or what. And these, these people in the Bible study kept saying, Tom, the Bible teaches a hell. Whether you like it or not, it's in there. So you know what I did my first year in college? I reread the New Testament. Mm -hmm. Every time it mentioned hell, I wrote it down. It changed my mind. And now I believe in literal, eternal hell. Why? Because I like the concept or I understand the concept. No, Jesus taught it. Mm -hmm. And so we're obligated, you know, I, there's all kinds of things I don't understand that are in the Bible. There's, there's all kinds of things. I don't understand electricity. I still use mm -hmm. the flip, flip on, the, on the light. So lots of things we don't understand, but we have to trust that God knows more than we do, that Jesus knows more than we do, and Jesus said there's a hell. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. I heard you say we can't do anything for our salvation, but don't we have to repent and believe in Christ to be saved? Isn't that something we do? You do have to repent and believe in Christ to be saved. Ultimately, that's not something you do. It's something the Holy Spirit does in us. And let me show you where I get this. Ephesians chapter two, for by God's grace you have been saved through faith. It's a gift of God, not as a result of works that no one should boast. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that is not your own doing, it's a gift of God. The word that refers back to the, great, the way the Greek is, it refers back to the grace and the faith so not only is God's grace something you don't do, your faith is also a gift from God to you. Mm -hmm. I cannot, uh, this is Martin Luther now I'm quoting, I, I, I believe I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in my Lord Jesus Christ or come to him, but the Holy Spirit does that. So, okay. yeah. But you do have to repent. You do have to believe in Christ to be saved, but those are gifts of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Did Jesus save us from God the Father's anger? Yeah, that's what we just preached on. Yes, he also saved us from his anger, mm -hmm. and he saved us from the anger of the Holy Spirit. All three persons of the Trinity are one God, but all three persons have love and anger against, love for sinners and anger against mm -hmm. sin. And you know, it's good God's angry against our sin, because our sin destroys us. Mm -hmm. And if you're a parent and your daughter is doing drugs, doesn't it make sense that you hate drugs? I mean, and I think that's the way it is. Because God loves us, he hates our sin. So. Okay. Does a Christian ever experience the wrath of God? Does God ever punish believers? I think when Jesus died on the cross and said, it is finished, I think that meant the punishment for our sin is finished, so Christians will never go to hell. So I don't think when, I don't think I experience God's wrath. Jesus took all the wrath of God for me. I do experience God's discipline. Mm -hmm. Hebrews 12 says, don't regard lightly. God disciplines those whom he loves. So for me, if I do something, let's say that God forbid I was to go be sexually promiscuous and get herpes. Mm -hmm. Is that the wrath of God? Well, God is gonna use that to discipline me. Mm -hmm. I think it's the discipline of God for a believer. So, um, but you know, and Mona, I know you go to a church that believes in the pre-tribulation or rapture of the church, and you've got a good preacher, I've heard him preach. I think we're here till the second coming. I think the rapture happens when Christ returns, not seven years before. Nevertheless, I won't name him, but there's a certain popular preacher on TV, and he had a sermon, something like 19 ways to be rapture ready. 
to be ready for their, well, I think the rapture being caught up mm -hmm. happens when Christ comes down at the second coming. Uh, he believes seven years before that, Christians disappear to go to heaven to miss the wrath of God that's coming. And, 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 they, and people that believe in the pre-tribulation rapture say Christians will never go through the wrath of God. Well, it's possible for an event to happen and it to be wrath for the world and discipline for the church. I mean, the church needs a lot of discipline these days. We do. So, uh, <laughs> and, and my belief is, but the Bible says the godly will be persecuted. Mm -hmm. So I don't think we get a zip out of this planet early. Now, I, I'm going to get letters on this, maybe. <laughs> I've studied this. It's not like I haven't read some of these. Th but just, and, and I don't doubt the faith of your pastor or you or the people that believe mm -hmm. in the preacher. But I've got to say this. <sighs> the whole view that Christians disappear, disappear seven years before the second coming of Christ that's almost nowhere in church history. It starts in the 1800s. I think a woman had a vision in New England. Uh, and I know that you know people say it's in the Bible. They show me the verses, I don't see it. So anyway, there you go. All right. <laughs> Next. <laughs> Next. Why do you teach that mankind is basically bad? Aren't we created in God's image and therefore perfect just the way we are? We were created in God's image, but something happened called the fall. Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, and yes, we're still we're still in the image of God, but it's a dim image now mm -hmm. because we've been wrecked by the fall. I mean, Mona, uh, there are groups within the ELCA Lutheran Church that are promoting homosexuality, and one of them wrote, "We're all made in God's image." And talking about homosexual people are born homosexual, and therefore they're perfect just the way they are. This is a Lutheran talking? When, since when do Lutherans believe we're perfect? Lutherans believe we are utterly sinful and need grace. But this is how crazy it gets. No, because of the fall, even though we're still in the image of God, that image has fallen and we need, we need redemption. So, um, you know, uh, let me see. Aunt Mona, it says in, in John chapter 2, Now Jesus was entrusting himself to no man, for Jesus knew what was in man and had no one, no need for anyone to tell him what was in. In other words, Jesus had a pretty low view of humankind. He knew we were sinners, therefore he did not trust us. I don't trust me, Mona. Mm -hmm. I'm a sinner. So, no, we're not perfect. <laughs> we all need Jesus. We, we sure do. I mean, Mona, I grew up Lutheran in a good church. And here's what we said in church every Sunday at the beginning of the service. We'd confess our sins. Almighty Father, uh, have mercy on me, a poor, miser a poor, miserable sinner. I confess I've sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what I've done, but what I've left undone, and I justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for these sins and, and, and trust uh, in the bitter, innocent, bitter sufferings of death of Jesus Christ. So you need both. You need to know that you're a sinner, otherwise Christ doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. But you also need to know he's a forgiving God mm -hmm. when you come to him. Amen. Yeah. I believe once a person is born again, he becomes a new creature in Christ and is no longer a sinner. Do you believe a person can continue to sin and still be saved? I think we sin daily in thought, word, and deed. So yes, we continue to sin even after salvation. And we're, we're taught to pray the Lord's Prayer. Right in the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our trespasses. Mm -hmm. Why are we taught that if, we're not, if we never sin anymore? I mean, there are groups, they're, they're called holiness churches, where they believe you can, once you became a true Christian, you don't sin anymore. I, I had an argument one, but I think it was D.L. Moody, mm -hmm. who was preaching one night in, I think, Chicago, and during his sermon, some guy kept interrupting, Amen, Brother Moody, I haven't sinned for 15 years. And Moody ignored him, kept reading, Amen, Brother Moody, I haven't sinned for 15. Finally, Moody stopped his sermon and said, Sir, is your wife here tonight? No. <laughs> well, would you go home and bring her? I want to hear her say that you haven't sinned for 15 years. <laughs> so, yes, we sin after conversion. But I got to give you the other side now. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, do not be deceived. The unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor robbers, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you, but you were washed through Christ and the Holy Spirit. If you're living in impenitent mm -hmm. sin, 
There's no sorrow over sin. There's no repentance. You're living with your girlfriend or boyfriend, and you're not going to repent. Your soul's in danger. Mm -hmm. And you need to read 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, and you need to repent, or I think your soul is in eternal danger. Mm -hmm. So it's both in a way. Mm -hmm. True. <laughs> yeah. All righty. Next question. I have a sin habit that I know is wrong, but I can't stop doing it. Am I not really a Christian? Any advice on how to get victory? I think when you come to Christ for forgiveness, even if you've done it a hundred times mm -hmm. or more, there's forgiveness. But you need to come to Christ, you need to battle. And I would say to this person, do you have anybody in your life that knows your sin struggle, that can hold you accountable, that you can pray with once a week, and they'll hold, that's what it says in James chapter five, confess your sins to one another, mm -hmm. pray for one another that you may be healed. So I would highly encourage, yes, I always, when I sin, I claim 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive my sins. So when I sin, I ask God's forgiveness. I believe I'm forgiven, whether I feel it or not, I believe I'm forgiven, but then you gotta fight. Mm -hmm. And the way we do that is, is by having other Christians hold us accountable. So can you plan on sinning and doing that same sin and just say, well, I'll just ask for forgiveness tomorrow. I, I just think that shows that maybe you're not saved. I mean, if you're truly saved, you sin, but you hate it. Mm -hmm. You repent. You don't live in it and put a smile on your face and mm -hmm. say, I'm not going to quit this. Grace, grace, grace. No, you right. don't. No, you don't. Okay. Yeah. Do you believe God will judge America? Mona, I am so concerned Finally, we overthrow Roe versus Wade, mm -hmm. and I can't remember how many millions of babies we've killed. Finally, we overthrow it, and now states around the country are wanting abortion back and enshrining in mm -hmm. their state constitutions the right to abortion. So here is what Ohio, which is a conservative state, mm -hmm. did a while ago. They voted to enshrine abortion into the state constitution abortion up to a certain date, but after that date, if the doctor deems it's necessary for the life and health of the mother, then they can do the abortion right up to the day of, of birth. Mm -hmm. Now, notice the life and health of the mother. What does the health of the mother mean? Financial health, social health, mental health, emo and, and, and who gets to decide in Ohio? Mm -hmm. The abortion doctor who's making money off of abortion. This is evil, and Mona, uh, I think God is gonna judge America for what we're doing. Jesus said, to whom much is given shall much be required. We've been given so much in America and to see America's love affair with abortion, I think God's gonna do something. It's sad. I don't know what, but uh, yeah, there and you go. And Jeremiah 1, 5 says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you a prophet to the nation. Yeah. God knows us before we are born. Psalms 139, he knit us together in our mother's womb. Yeah. God has a plan for yes, every life. Yeah, yeah. Well, there you go. Thanks for joining us today. Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God bless you. See you next time. Thank you for watching the Pastor Study. You can watch more of our programs at pastorstudy.org. We are on the air preaching the good news of Jesus Christ because of the generous support of you, our viewers. Would you consider supporting our ministry? You may do so at pastorstudy.org or write the Pastor Study, P.O. Box 41294, Minneapolis, Minnesota 55441. May the blessing of our one triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you now and forever.